Hi. Literally uh, yesterday, I woke up and this confronted me. And now in modern societies, half of the population is either weight or frankly is bat battling with obesity. And perhaps more troubling still is the acceleration in obesity rates amongst children. Is it really that surprising that obesity is swamping the modern and actually middle and low income countries as well? My previous life was this. Woke up at about 7.30, rolled out of bread, <coughs> bed. <laughs> I didn't roll out of a piece of bread. <laughs> Drank coffee made by a machine, staggered into the car, drove to work, ate lunch at my desk as 60% of workers do, did Facebook for a couple of hours, took a little nap, then went home. On the way home, of course, when the traffic was bad, you do a drive through a little munch on the way home, got home, then it was sofa, app for dinner, remote control, and that was my day. It's extraordinary when you think about it that I could spend an entire day and walk less than 100 meters, yet consume 5,000 calories. And the question is, why isn't everybody battling obesity? And that's the question we asked. We brought healthy volunteers to our laboratories at Mayo Clinic. And we fed people every single sort of calorie, every single food that we actually chemically analyzed that they ate. And we determined exactly how many calories a person needs to keep their body weight steady. So for me, that would be 2,700 calories. We then did what became known as the great gorging experiment. I wouldn't quite describe it as that. We overfed everybody by an extra 1,000 calories a day. Now, you might think it's very hard to overfeed people. It's actually extraordinarily easy. An extra 1,000 calories a day is just an extra Big Mac and a shake. And again, if you, if you think that's a lot, then you need to sort of drive with me from work to home because a Big Mac and a shake is exactly my snack of choice before dinner. So overfeeding people by an extra 1,000 calories a day is extraordinarily easy, and we did that day in and day out under supervised conditions for eight weeks so that everyone in our studies got overfed 56,000 extra calories. As expected, many of the volunteers took every extra calorie and put it into body fat. Okay. However, what was absolutely fascinating was that some of our volunteers gained no weight at all. They didn't poop it out because we actually collected all their poop. We... <laughs> You've got to love science. <laughs> Freezers full of poop. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't told that this was like a high school audience. But anyway, um, they didn't poop it out, and they didn't go to the gym because we tracked that too. What happens when people overfeed and extraordinarily don't go, gain weight, is they activate their non-exercise activity thermogenesis, their non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And we ask the question, how? How can you burn off 800 calories, not go to the gym, not go pooping mad, and stay thin? So, obviously, we design magic underwear. Magic underwear. <laughs> This is what we do. Magic underwear is literally underwear under garments here, pants or panties, one might call them, and a bra-like uh, thing up here, worn throughout the day under one's clothes. And these unmagic underwear had embedded in them sensors that allowed us to capture 13 axes of movement continuously during the day and night. So that for day in and day out, and yes, you do wash the magic underwear, Day, day in and day out, we knew exactly what people were doing. Day in and day out. And yes, this is obviously G-rated, but we knew exactly what people were doing. And then we repeated the sort of the gorging experiment. 
And what we found is that those people who can overfeed by 1,000 calories extra a day and gain no weight, what they're actually doing, and it's subtle, is they're getting up and walking around pretty much just like this. And they're doing it cumulatively over a day, two and a half hours more than people who are gaining the weight. It's extraordinary. Not going to the gym, not running, not pacing, not dropping sweat. But people who are staying thin in the light of overfeeding are getting up and moving spontaneously, if you like, two and a half hours a day more. It's extraordinary than people who have a tendency to gain excess body weight. We ask the obvious question. Well, maybe this is relevant to obesity. So we went into now normal offices and again, carrying our magic underwear, as one does. On one side of the cubicle can be somebody who's slim. On the other side of the cubicle can be somebody battling excess body weight, doing all the diets, doing the whole thing. What differentiates them, we found, or at least the magic underwear taught us, was that people who are thin are up and moving around throughout their day two and a quarter hours a day more than people with obesity. People with obesity have a tendency to be seated two and a quarter hours a day more. It then became clear that this wasn't only about the energy expenditure of obesity. There was more to it. Because then data, because once the technology was available, it became devices like all the tracking devices that we wear, it, the data was coming in faster and faster and faster. It became clear that people who are sitting more, regardless of their body weight, are prone to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, low mood, mechanical back problems, and even certain types of cancer, including breast and prostate cancer. So excess sitting isn't simply a matter of not burning calories, if you like. It's very much the case that excess sitting is seriously harmful for health. And we started to ask the question, well, if there's this counterbalance between those people who are getting up and moving and staying healthy and those individuals who are prone to be seated still and develop type 2 diabetes, etc., is there something, is there a mechanical, is there a biological cause for this? Is there a causality? So we started to investigate the brain mechanisms, and we found three things. The first is that at the center of the brain is a tiny area, a tiny dot, if you like, smaller than a font eight period. It's the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. Try saying that after a couple of beers. Um, the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus is tiny, but it appears to be sort of central, the central station for driving movement. That's where all the impulses are coming out of. And they're counter-regulated, by the way, with appetites. So appetite signals are coming in and movement signals are going out. Okay, number two, there are a whole load of neurochemicals. Orexin is one. I said orexin is one. G-rated. Orexin is one. There are a whole load of chemicals that are feeding onto the paraventricular nucleus to drive these movements. Now, what's really interested in animals inbred for obesity, the brain, the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, is insensitive, is not sensitive to the orexin chemical. For those animals inbred for leaners who are moving that much more, the brain is hypersensitive to orexin. So you imagine this model now of people, some are hypersensitive to move, others are prone to, to be less movable, if you like. The third thing we identified is fascinating. And as I look across the audience, it's very, very clear. It's fascinating. Each and every one of us have, a, have an innate pulse to move. Move, move, move. That pulse exists right across biology, not just humans, horses, cows, rats, mice, all the way down to worms. There is this pulse from deep inside of the brain to move. So how does this all fit together? So now you can imagine a group of humans, a group of people. Some people all have the pulse to move because it's the, it's the way we're built. It's the innate biology to search and find our food, to grow food, to chase food, to kill food, and then eat it to find shelter. We're, we're built to move. That is how the human being, if you like, was designed. 
That move, that drive is there, but some are less responsive to the signals. And those are the individuals, you might argue, are the ones who are, if you build a society full of chairs, they are the individuals prone to sit in them. Whether the chair is in the office, whether it's in the school, whether it's at home, whether it's on the bus, it doesn't matter. Those are the individuals who have a predisposition to sit and stay seated. That's most of us. And you, we start to appreciate what a drive this is to have low energy expenditure, a predisposition to obesity. Yes, sure, it's fine. They're a group of individuals prone to get up and move and stay moving and remain thin. Good luck to them. Fantastic. But for the rest of us, it's a struggle, or is it? If you argue that this has occurred because we've designed a society to suppress this natural pulse to move, this natural fidget factor, if you like, surely we can design societies to reverse it. It just requires a little bit of ingenuity. Yes, it's possible. Workplaces, whether that's treadmill desks, standing desks, devices to help you stand, a long cord on your telephone so that when the call go phone goes, you get off your chair and sort of pace around. It, it's, uh, all I can tell you is it stops you falling asleep during a call. Walk and talk meetings, convert a, a one-hour meeting from, what, from a sitting boring meeting to a walking boring meeting. Lunchtime, instead of gossiping over, what is it, a, you know, a Kit Kat and a sandwich, that's my, uh, uh, that's my lunch of choice, gossip over a sandwich with a walk. It's very easy, in fact, with the right will and with the right motivation and right leadership to, to elevate workers in, in offices and to have people move. And you might say, well, great, health outcomes. Health outcomes are phenomenal. For those individuals who want to lose weight, they lose weight. Glucose, glycemic control, glucose control improves, cholesterol comes down, all that kind of stuff. Obvious. Yes, it happens. But what is really fascinating is you might be thinking, well, if my office gets up and moves and becomes dynamic, surely productivity goes down. Wrong. There have been 107 studies conducted in workplaces. Workplaces that adopt this active philosophy have improved productivity by 11 to 17%, depending what you measure. Active work is more productive work. And of course, it makes sense. Gone are the two hours in the afternoon doing Facebook. Gone is my nap in the afternoon. I'm up, moving, happy, more productive. How about kids? What's fascinating is we, we built all these programs around developing office places and so on. We thought, kids, ah, oh, it's going to be impossible. They're fidgeting, it's da, 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 impossible. It's fascinating. If you give kids, children, the opportunity to get up and move and learn, two times two equals four. Four times four equals 16, indeed. If you give kids the opportunity to move and learn, they actually learn better. 28,000 students in, the California, in, the, in California, active learning program, standing desks, active learning, their grades are 10% better than age match controls. Children learn better if you allow them to move. And we've done studies all the way from three-year-olds all the way to high school students. It's true right across the spectrum. Active learning, active mind. Active body, active soul. Challenge. One time today, please, find an opportunity to get up and move 10 minutes more than you would have done. Then get up and move. Thank you. <laughs>